Let and then it's that. just us just kind of just sitting here going, <laughs> is it on yet? Yep. This is a live recording night of uh, episode 24 of the Midlife Pilot Podcast. It's going to be all about flying clubs. And I see us on the internet. Do you concur? Uh, well, if you do. I see us. Oh, yeah. The We're there. And here we are. Lots of people in the chat room ready to go. Thanks. Have a good time. Guest is waiting in the uh, proverbial green room. So uh, I say we get this show on the road. What do you say? Right on. Let's do it. Let's do it. And welcome to the Midlife Pilot Podcast. This is a podcast. Oh, this is a podcast all about uh, flying, <laughs> learning to fly the art of aviation. <laughs> Brian, it's I didn't, um, say, I didn't say a word. <laughs> it's, it's also a technical. Uh, it's a technical feat of excellence that we produce for you once every two weeks. Uh, here on the YouTube channel and wherever you get your audio podcasts. And uh, we're glad you're here. My name is Chris Moran. Uh, I have a channel on YouTube called The Midlife Pilot. And uh, to my left, my right, your left, um, is uh, the legendary co-host, Brian Siskin. Good evening, sir. But you, where am I based out of? Though? You have to have like... Based out of uh, Music Row, the heart of, uh, heart of Music Row, heart of Skid Row... Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> hey, man, how's it going? Uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm super excited about our guest today. I'm glad to see everybody's in the chat. Super excited. Uh, and a uh, quick shout out to Steve Cross, who soloed today. I got to witness that. That was real cool. Congrats to Steve. Awesome. Way to go, Steve. And I'm, I've already seen a great contingent of our uh, of our faithful friends in the chat tonight. And I know there's going to be a lot of questions uh, for our guest about flying clubs. That has become a topic. Um, I think it is uh, partially not, and not in any small part to the fact that I talk about the one that I'm in a lot. Um, and there always seems to be questions and we decided we could probably make a whole episode about it. And uh, there was enthusiastic encouragement for that. So that's what we're going to do uh, tonight. I do have to take a minute and ask you, I know you've been doing some flying and some uh, new, new aircraft. What's been going on with you there? Well, I just wanted to be more like you. And yeah, so, I uh, I got my hands on, a, uh, and it's actually interesting. We're talking about the flying club thing. Cause I've been sort of in these sort of pseudo kind of clubs, uh, and various things, but, uh, I'm in a situation now where I just needed a different situation and I started flying an archer, um, yesterday and then I'm flying it again tomorrow and then I'll be good to go. Uh, it's kind of a neat sort of, um, alternative to the conventional club thing i suppose because clubs here like you're there's a two-year waiting list to get you know in the lebanon flying club or various clubs around here so you have to find things and uh, i got a creative sort of rental arrangement where it's essentially four pilots um kind of uh doing a little bit of a co-op rental uh quarterly um with sort of prepaid set of hours and we just kind of work it out among ourselves for the schedule and you can take it overnight and you can do whatever you want and all that. Cool. So anyway, pretty cool. And then otherwise the big news is that I finally got signed up with, um, Catherine Cavagnero to do spin training on December 7th. So I've got a lot wow. of time to get freaked out about that, but I'm super excited about, uh, getting spin training and, and being with a, a legend, you know, flying with a legend. That's awesome. I'm very jealous. That sounds amazing. Uh, we'll see how it goes. We'll see. Don't be jealous too quickly. I'm excited for you. Well, I got to do a little flying too, uh, since we last talked, um, it was actually time for my flight review, which, uh, had been two years since my check ride. And I got to go out with, um, a great flight instructor uh, who teaches uh, some students that are in our club. Uh, her name's Victoria. The video is coming out Friday. So that's October 7th uh, on the channel. It was, it was kind of cool because it was a, uh, you know, VFR flight review that actually turned into about, I got to log six tenths of an hour of actual uh, instrument time and ended up with an instrument lesson and shot a, um, our nav approach to minimums at my home airport. So, so it was awesome. like, 
it's a bonus flight review. It's a flight review plus some uh, instrument training all in one. So we had a great time. The video is awesome. I think you guys are going to really have a good time. Victoria is great, uh, great personality. So some of the people in the chat have already seen the video uh, from my Patreon page. And uh, the rest of it will be for the rest of you on Friday. So it should be. Yeah. Fun. And it's another reason for people to get on your Patreon because uh, you, you do a great job of giving the full length flights too. Um, and you get a lot out of it. So that one's a, particularly a great one. She's awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, good time. I say we uh I say yeah. we say hi to Drew. What do you say? Yeah. Welcome everybody. Our guest tonight uh is uh Drew Myers. Drew is uh with AOPA's uh Flying Club Initiative. Thank you for a last minute uh for agreeing to join <laughs> us tonight and talk about one of your favorite topics I know, uh flying oh, yeah. clubs. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here, everyone. For sure. So Drew, I met Drew in 2020, uh, when I had a crazy idea to start the Fairmont flying club, uh, that I run my, the plane that I was training in that you guys are familiar with five, two Lima, the orange interior 172. the uh, owners were renting it to me, um, for my flight training. And they said, we're not going to do that anymore. It's costing us too much insurance. We'll let you finish your check ride. And then we're not going to rent anymore. And I thought, well, what am I going to do? And, uh, I'd done some research, found some of the great resources, uh, on AOPA site for flying clubs and asked Drew some questions and then went back to the owner and said, if I start a flying club, can I lease your plane? And they were like, we would love something like that. And that's how the <laughs> club, club was born. And, uh, so we've kind of stayed in touch since then. And, yeah. um, it's been, yeah, I think you have the record, helpful. you have the record for the fastest flying club from first contact to operational flying club. I think <laughs> it you, was like a have- week. Yeah, I was I was blown away. I mean, there's I've been doing this for three years now, and there's people that I started talking to when I first joined the OPA that are still working on their club. So, yeah, it's oh, a it's awesome. definitely a process. Well, we got lucky. We had a handful of people who were equally eager to have something going, and we just kind of got it off the ground. But what's really amazing to me uh, is what's happened since then. So that was September of 2020, and here we are, October 5th, 2022. And we started with six members. And as of today, the club is at 36 with wow. three airplanes um, in little rural West Virginia. And it's um, and there's no sign of it stopping. And I think some of that is the demand. I mean, people are, you know, the aviation industry. I mean, people are searching for flight opportunities. Um, and I think some of that is kind of driven it. But so, uh, more than half of our membership are people in very similar cases to me, you know, people kind of in my stage of life, just looking for aircraft to fly that are, you know, in good condition and are affordable and flying clubs. I think that's one of the magic to clubs is that I don't think there's a better way to fly airplanes affordably than when you do it with a group of other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I can't, can't agree with you more, man. So you've been at this for a while. You're also a pilot. Is that true? How yeah. long have you tell us a little about your aviation? What's your what's your kind of aviation background? Yeah, sure. So I got into aviation. I, I got my aviation merit badge when I was like 14, and part of that was I got a ride in the Cessna 150. And it was just like a quick around the around the pattern thing, um, and the pilot let me have the controls for a few seconds, and I was just completely hooked. I started saving my money. I started reading flight manuals, everything. Um, and ended up soloing on my 16th birthday, but never, never finished my radiant in high school. Cause I, I, I was painting houses over the summer to pay for my flight training. And it just wasn't, wasn't progressing fast enough. Um, so I hung it up, went to college, graduated, moved to Maryland. I'm uh, originally from central Pennsylvania and I moved to, moved here to Maryland and, uh, started saving money again and, and finished my pilot's, finish my pilot's license. I did that at freeway airport, which is in uh, just outside the freeze in the, the Washington special flight rules area. Mm-hmm. Um, did that in 2015 and I've uh, been an active pilot ever since I now am a instrument rated commercial pilot working on my uh, CFI. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. Awesome. And then on the uh, flying club side, I've been a member of free state flying club since 2018 um, I joined, I was, I, I was also on the wait list for over two years to, to join that club, but it was a, good, a really nice operation. And I, I knew a, a lot of the pilots that were members there. So I knew it'd be a good fit for me and the, the type of flying I like to do. Um, so yeah, I joined that and I've been active. I am now the safety officer and, uh, I help out with the maintenance uh, team as well. That's awesome. So. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's been, a, it's been a, a fun journey and I'm, I'm very fortunate that I get to, you know, stay current and, you know, I, ha- I haven't really been rusty in my flying career, which I'm very, very fortunate about. Um, and then, um, yeah. So, and then 
in 2019, September 2019, I I left my other gig. I used to sell paint, work for Sherman Williams Paint Company. So I sold paint to pay for my flying. And then I turned pro and uh, joined the OPA as the manager of the Flying Club Initiative. So um, that's been, it's been a really fun gig. Um, awesome people. I mean, you know, Chris, you said it perfectly. I mean, sharing, sharing uh, an airplane is probably one of the best ways to access flying. And it really is like the essence of aviation and what's so great about aviation because it's, you know, people are passionate. It's the, it's a community and you know, the common ground is the airplane. So the, yeah. the people that I get to work with are just, you know, they, they all get it. They, they get that, you know, a journey shared is a journey cherished. And um, so that's been, it's just really fun to, to talk to people all over the country. Um, we've, we've helped form, I think we're up to 213 clubs in the six years we've been doing this all over the wow. country that we've, that we've started and we we support a network of over a thousand flying clubs that we recognize all over the country. That's fantastic. And there are great resources online, not just for people interested in starting a club, which we're going to yeah. get into all of that, all the nuts and bolts of some of that here in a minute. But for people searching for flying clubs, you guys have done an excellent job with your directory. Um, this is the URL, I believe. You can fly org slash flying dash clubs. Yeah. And there is and probably there are other ways to get there. That is the way that I do it. But um, there are great. I update my profile pretty regularly with current information on our club, but I've, I've just, I look around at other clubs. It's a great resource just to kind of see what other people are doing, what else is out there, what kind of clubs exist. Um, but it's been fun to watch that map grow. I mean, even over the, you know, since ours started in 2020 to kind of see new people pop up on the map. And the next time I go like that, it's like, Oh, that club wasn't there the last time I looked or. Yeah. Yeah. So you kind of keep track of what's happening there. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Fundamentals for a minute. What, sure. what is, what constitutes a flying club? I mean, what, is that a fair question? What, what is a fly? Oh I mean, yeah. What makes up a flying club? What defines a flying club? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's a couple different definitions out there and we'll start with, you know, naturally we'll start with what the FAA considers a flying club and they call it, it's a nonprofit member run um, organization for the express purpose of, of sh sharing an aviation amongst the membership. Right. So um, flying clubs by definition do not provide services to the public. They're exclusive member uh, um, owned and run organizations. Um, no one person can profit off of a flying club. And um, you know, only members of the flying club are allowed to access and use the airplanes. So um, the the exclusivity of that is very important. And because of that, because they're exclusive organizations, um, airport operator, airport managers, and the FAA um, treat flying clubs as individuals. So they're not regulated like you would see a commercial operator uh, on the field be be regulated. So um, that's that's the the gist of it. Um, you know, and then, and of course, uh, a flying club is always nonprofit. They're uh, they're not a for profit venture in any any sense of the word. Um, and so, yeah, so that the exclusive use part is the one that took some uh, took some explaining as we were pursuing aircraft leases, like in our case. Oh, yeah. um, we, and I think a lot of clubs that are so there's well, we should probably also define the the kind of like the equity versus non equity club. Yeah before we get too deep into these weeds. So do you want to, can you touch on that briefly? Like what the, like there's equity clubs and there's non-equity. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and mixes of the, of the two as well. So uh, generally speaking, flying clubs can own their airplanes in two different ways, or sorry, I should say they can access their aircraft in two different ways. Either the club owns the airplane outright or is making payments on it on a loan. Um, those clubs are called equity flying clubs. And then, and by extension of that, every member owns a share of the club and the club's assets. So um, the share values are typically, you know, higher. My club is an equity club, and our buy-in is, a, I think, last I checked, is like sixty-eight hundred bucks for a for a two airplane club that we that we own outright. Um, the other option for for clubs is the non-equity route, where um, it's it's uh, the the club is an exclusive lease uh, of an aircraft. And um, it's, it's a little bit different. Uh, some people kind of call it a lease back and that's, that's not really correct. A lease back to like a flight school. Um, anyone can walk in off the street and through that flight school, rent that aircraft um, with a, a flying club lease. It's exclusive. So only members of the flying club uh, can, can access and fly the airplane. So Chris, if you owned an airplane and leased it to my flying club that you weren't a member of, you, you couldn't fly it. So right. it has to be exclusive. And um, the FAA again, they, they want the club to have quote owner like privileges is what they call it. So yeah. I tried to convince a lender, uh, 
that what I was going to do with my airplane wasn't a lease back because it was going to a flying club, but they, they, they don't see it the same way that we, yeah. Do. So I, that's why I always belabor that point. Cause yeah, it's, it's way different than the lease back. And, and right. when you're talking, you know, and by the way, the non-equity route with the, the clubs that we've been forming lately with the, the price of, of, of uh, used aircraft and well and new aircraft too. Um, it's, it, it's a lot easier for a club to form by leasing an airplane. So, you know, one, one selling point you can, you can have with an owner is, Hey, look, you know, we're, you're going to lease your, your airplane to us, but you'll know who's flying it. Only this group of people, only this group of pilots are going to be flying it. Not some, it's not going to be, you know, mo most clubs don't do a ton of flight training. I mean, you can certainly do flight training in the club, but now I'd like to talk about that some more, but generally speaking, you know, uh, clubs are usually more proficiency flying, right? So it's, it's active pilots who aren't training. They're not beating the snot out of the airplane in the pattern every day. That's right. Every, so yeah so in our <clears throat> case we made the decision uh at the formation of the club partially because we wanted to get up and running so fast and we had someone that was willing to lease their plane to us we made the decision at the beginning to be a non-equity um a non-equity club that entered into exclusive use lease with our airplane owners um and that was the fun point to try to explain to airplane owners like yes so when you sign the lease it explicitly states like you can't that the owners no longer can like rent it to other people on the side and they can't access their airplane without being bona fide members of the club as well and paying their mm -hmm. lease you know playing the club uh the club rates for the planes as well um yep. and that's worked out really well and the reason i'm an advocate it's not for every there are clubs that make sense to be equity clubs, especially if you have a small group of people who want to kind of be together on an airplane or whatever. There's ways to make that work. I've been a proponent of the non-equity route because I think it allows for kind of a nimble, a more nimble approach to the club. First of all, the club has, we report zero assets. We, we yeah. own no assets. So for tax, I mean, it's a much easier much cleaner from the, you know, the taxation perspective and what the, what the organization owns, but also, as the kind of makeup of the club changes through its stages of life, it's a lot more, it's a lot easier to, as a lease expires with an owner, say, we're not going to renew this lease for this airplane. This next lease, we're going to lease this other airplane. You know, it, it allows the club to be a little bit more flexible in terms of what it's uh, available aircraft are at any stage of its life. So yeah, we haven't found that yet and that we haven't gotten rid of any planes. We've just been adding more leases to our, to our group, but it's also, um, is it, is it, do you find, sorry, Brian, you can have a minute. Does it, uh, <laughs> I've, I've dominated cause we're on a topic that I love, but do yeah. you, have you found in working with other clubs are a lot of clubs, the, the aircraft that they're leasing, are they often leased from LLCs that are members owned like members of the club own the planes that they're leasing back to their clubs Are you yeah that? yeah that's generally the case it's it's someone who's very either a member of the club or very very close to the club and and you know it may be someone that's they, they don't have time to be in the club but they they have this airplane that they want to see flown more so they you know they, they know the club very intimately um i don't see a lot of you know people that own 10, 15 airplanes, at least in the flying club, right. that's not, that's, that's very, that's very rare. And that's kind of pushing the boundaries a little bit, I think. Um, yeah. So that's, that's typically what it is. And, and by the way, you, you can be a club that owns one airplane and leases another airplane too. So that was our club last year. We, we decided we had room in our hearts for another airplane. So we, we expanded and, and uh, ended up buying a Cardinal, but we were, we we're really close to leasing a Cherokee. Um, mm -hmm. that the uh, owner at a local airfield, you know, the, the, typ the typical situation for a lease is someone owns the airplane. They're maybe not getting the, the utilization out of it that they'd like. Um, they, I mean, as you know, airplanes need to fly to, to stay healthy. Right. So um, but they don't want to sell it and they, they don't want to, you know, they obviously don't want to see it in a flight school. So that's that's a good opportunity. If you have like some hangar queens on your airport. And you know that you, you that's something. This is something you can kind of approach the owner with and say, "Hey, look, you know, I've got this group of folks that want to want to use your airplane. It's you know, it's all above board. You, here's our bylaws. Here's the lease agreement. You know, and kind of kind of go from there. So that's that is also an option to own and lease an airplane at the same time. <laughs> Are there people that you're like hawking at your airport where they're like, "Dude, no, you come every two weeks. I hear from you. This is driving me nuts. Like, no, hey. I don't want to do this. We don't want to be your cult." We had a, tonight, actually, we had an airport. I mean, we had a, a flying club board meeting tonight and literally one of the discussions was we were throwing out tail numbers of planes on the field <laughs> of people we were going to approach. We have an overhaul coming up on our on our workhorse, our 172 uh, an engine overhaul. It's going to be out for three, like three months. So we were trying to kick around this idea of a short term lease 
to replace it while it's out. And uh, we were literally like naming people and making notes of people we were going to call this week <laughs> to see if we can lease their airplane for a while. So that's nice. that is how it is, Brian. We're like we're eyeballing up the people around our uh, around our airport trying to snag <laughs> somebody's airplane. So yeah. Well, I guess, so one of the things I'm curious about is just, and I think it's important to maybe reflect as I learn a little bit more about it too. Is you know the one of the things I've found a, a legitimate actual flying club. There's a spirit about it that is really about like you said, proficiency, but also a, a safety culture. And you said that you're, you know, you're a safety officer. Yeah. So yeah. I guess I'm just curious and we don't have to like sort of cut into the middle of it, but maybe we can get illuminated on just, you know, what are the general roles and responsibilities structurally in a flying club? Who's, who's running it and how does that work? And then I'm really specifically interested in, in the safety officer and your role and how that works. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we're to start with that. So uh, you know, um, legally and like, um, flying clubs should be structured as a nonprofit corporation. Um, so you, you have to have the, you know, your president, your secretary, your treasurer, those are like the, the main officer or board of director roles that you have to have. Um, because clubs are social organizations, it's a really good idea to have a social officer, someone that's going to plan the barbecues, plan the cookouts, plan the plane, plane washes and things like that. And, um, and that's, that's really another thing that, that separates flying clubs from other forms of aircraft ownership. Like you're in, it's kind of like a fractional ownership, um, kind of like a plane share type of, uh, agreement. Um, you know, there's not really, there maybe not, isn't like a social aspect to that, right? You're, you're working with the pilots. It's a business transaction. That's, that's how most, uh, airplane co-ownerships are. You know, if something breaks on the airplane, we all pitch in to fix it, but we, you know, we share the airplane evenly. Um, flying clubs are by definition social. So there is a, a, a lot of a lot of benefit to that. And especially if you're a, a rusty pilot or someone who's, you know, who who got their license and wants to keep flying, a flying club is just a great, a great way to do that. And you know, I, I could go down that path forever. But uh, back to the officer positions. Um, yeah, so you got your president, vice president, secretary, treasurer. They they handle all the bookkeeping and the the, the necessary reporting for a club. Um, you also have to have uh, a maintenance officer, someone that's going to oversee the, the the maintenance and keep that running. Um, that that's a very important job, and um, it, it can be a lot of work even for one airplane. So um, mm -hmm. I, I used to be I was never the maintenance officer, but I was what we call a plane captain. So I like reported to the maintenance officer. Um, so we were kind of like the boots on the ground. If something broke on the airplane, we were the first people to go out to the airplane airport and kind of check it out and and get the the wheels and motions for a, for a repair. Um, so that's, that's a really important role. And then, yeah, the safety officer. So, so my job, I, I, you know, I kind of set the tone for the safety culture at the club. Um, I handle all the, the checkouts for and onboarding the new members to make sure that they are, they are properly trained in their airplanes. Um, and you know, the, the, the other th cool thing about flying clubs is you're going to see airplanes that you probably would never be able to rent. Yeah. Um, and our, mm -hmm. our, 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 our our workhorse is also a 172, but it's a highly modified 172. It's a it's a Franken Cessna. Uh, we've got power flow exhaust. We have electronic ignition. Um, all these cool like you know we we have an autopilot that actually works. Like mm -hmm. all this cool stuff um, that you know a, as a renter I'd never experienced any of that. And I, I'd flown you know I've you know, I've flown hundreds of hours in 172s by the time I joined the club. And you know I I had to learn all this stuff. So having a good checkout. Um, program is is so important and that really sets the tone for okay well this club is serious like they're they're taking it this they're, they're going to this length to get me checked out in this airplane um so you know that's a that's a big thing for for a club i think is that how you handle the onboarding process will really set the tone for your for your members um besides that you know we you know there, there, there can be we have a bunch of other kind of random officer positions basically whatever you need and, and um to to keep the club operating we had a, a airplane acquisition committee you know, when we were specking out purchasing a second airplane. So those are the roles. Um, and, you know, you'll find, you know, some people are more going to be more active in the club. Um, I'm, I, I used to be super active. I just had a, a son four months ago. So I'm kind of kind of pulling nice. back a little bit, you know. Um, but yeah, so it's it's a it's a great way to, to pull on people's strengths. And also, like, you know, we have our, we have a lot of, uh, you know, very tech savvy people. So we have a webmaster that handles all of our Google drives and our websites and things like that. And, you know, everyone's a volunteer. No one gets any compensation for this. So it's, it's, you know, all from the, the, you know, it's all from the, our, our generosity and our passion for the, for the flying club. 
we were talking about that while we were kind of gathered around. <clears throat> There's always a handful of people at the airport, whether they're flying or not, kind of in one of the hangars doing something or just mm-hmm. hanging out or looking around. And we were, we were actually having a conversation the other day. And I do, I do want to talk about, we kind of, you, you said you wanted to come back to training and I know, I know why you want to do that. And it's <laughs> important that there are some distinguished because we do a fair amount of training. So we have 36 members. Okay. Um, eight of them currently are primary students. So I guess that's not a lot. I mean, that's not a no. ton. There are some training that occurs in our, and there are, uh, you know, instructors who are also, who in our case are club members who are approved by the club to teach student members. So some of the, but okay, we'll get into that in a second. Sure. The point I was going to make about the culture was we were talking about there, the experiences you get just flying around a flying club, people of all different kind of backgrounds, different experience levels, different areas of expertise. Our club is also spoiled to death to have um, three AMPs who are also members. They don't do the work on our planes. We we use a local shop to do anything beyond what a pilot could already do on the planes, but we do all of our own oil changes and tires and light mm-hmm. bulbs and stuff that we can do. One of our AMPs actually did change a cylinder because he, we lost a cylinder on a plane while it was in Ohio. And he, thank God was the pilot who had it out there and could diagnose it in the field. And like, so, nice. so we, you know, so we're kind of spoiled in that regard, but we were talking about some of our students who get to experience some things that like you, in a part for 141 school or something like you may not have like put fuel in the airplane by the time you get your CFI. Seriously. I mean, we laugh at it, but like you haven't cleaned a windshield necessarily, or like, change the oil or seeing how any of this stuff works and the members who are just you know, kind of the student members who are just immersed around all of this other types of backgrounds and experience levels and the things you get to experience in my opinion I'm not trying to like say 61 versus 141 or whatever but i'm just saying <laughs> there is a much greater kind of immersion in all of aviation when you find a community like that and i think that's perfectly in line with the faa's definition of the spirit of a flying club i mean that to yeah. me is the when I step back as a whole and look at the makeup of our group and I see all of the little sub pieces that are working, I just say, this is the definition. I mean, this is exactly how it was intended to work. And I just think there's so much benefit to being around that. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's great. And you know, when, you know, with a, again, with, with no profit motive, right. There's, there's no, a lot clubs don't have things like minimum hours. If you take the plane out for a weekend or something. So it really, because it allows you to really kind of, Gosh, I can't believe I'm saying this. Kind of spread your wings as a pilot, right? So you get to you get to go go out there, and you know, when I joined the club, <laughs> it was like probably the first time I was able to do like a, a weekend cross country flight. Um, you know, so you get to use your pilot's license and and go to some cool places, and you know, it's it's always it's way more affordable. It's it's more affordable, but you're gonna end up spending way more money. Um, it's just <laughs> right. your, your dollars are your dollars are gonna go a lot farther. Because and by the way, most clubs bill on tack time, right? Because they're not they're not for profit. So, um, you know, most flight schools, I'm sure you're familiar, bill on Hobbs, but with tack time, you're only, you're only paying for when you're, you know, you know, when the engine RPMs are higher. So the, the savings there is pretty cool. It was like, you know, I've kind of felt like I was robbing the place the first couple of flights in the club plane. Like, well, I, I did this normal flight that would normally cost me like 200 bucks and it was way less. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. And do you couple- want to get into the, uh, the training aspect too? Like, uh, just talk about that. I do want to do that. I want to ask this question first. We're, I'm going to start yeah. peppering in some of these questions because they're going to back up on us. It is, believe it yeah. or not, already we've been in this 28 minutes already. So I'm going to wow. start peppering these. And there's some, I'm going to throw doozies at you. This isn't one of them, but there's one later that I want to talk about. Um, okay. We'll, we'll step on the lines of like, we'll tiptoe around the lines of profit and like people that lease their planes to clubs. <laughs> it's not profit, but I, I, we're going to tiptoe in a minute. Sure. Great. Josh said, if there's already a flying club that maybe has a long waiting list or is less than ideal for some reason, are there pitfalls to starting a rival one at the same airport? So like dueling flying clubs, like rival <laughs> flying clubs. Yeah. Yeah. There, um, there shouldn't be any pitfalls. And if there are pitfalls, then someone's probably not operating correctly. So again, nonprofit right so you know no one's gonna no one's gonna lose income if if some of their prospective members go to another flying club and if and if that club has a wait list they're probably are pretty vibrant and active and you know they're, they're not hurting for members so yeah so there you there, there's a, a market opportunity at that airfield to start another club I, I say go for it um and you know the the way that you get in trouble is if you if you form a flying club on a field and you start taking 
the, 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 when I get these phone calls, it's always my flying club is in trouble with the air, the airport manager because we have these student pilots that left the local flight school to join our club and resume their training. And again, flying clubs cannot compete, cannot promote flight instruction, cannot promote any services to the public. So that that's a pretty glaring example of, of when a club kind of crosses the line and doesn't really share the sandbox is when they start competing with the for profit operators. Uh, what is the line? I mean, like you can't promote flight training. So like I've looked at about a hundred flying club websites. Yep. Throughout the time. I mean, I'm that's not an exaggeration, probably a yeah. hundred. And I do want to talk about we're not I'm not gonna name any regions or any specific things. I know of a flight club in the United States, a flying club that as operates as a flying club that is operating for profit and it's a big one yep yep um which we again what's the line drew like i mean like uh, like a website for instance will say something like we'll have a disclaimer it says this is a flying club this is not a flight school um we do allow student members to join and receive training from in our club aircraft is that a line yeah. i mean that's not promoting i mean we're saying we're not a flight school but we do allow student members. Is that allowed? I mean, is that line okay? Yeah, that's that's okay. And I think um, so. I, I talk to people all over the country, right? And every airport is its own ecosystem. So the stuff that we promote and that we kind of preach from our soapboxes is stuff that's going to work at every airfield. So you know, there you can if you know you're in a rural area, right? So there's not there's not a lot of flight schools in in town, right? There's I, I'm guessing there's no flight schools at at uh at the at the field that you're based out Correct. of. Correct. Yeah. Right. So so you're not you're not stealing business from anyone or you know or possibly you know possibly doing that. Now if a flight school started on the field, you may have to kind of change your policies a little bit. And and also you have to think about what what makes sense for your club. Um my club for example, we don't allow student members. Um we there's enough flight training in the area and we you know go get your license and then this the day you get your private we'll consider you as a member and you know there, we have reasons for doing that right so we don't want you know uh, flight training tends to clog up schedules a little bit more it's more wear and tear in the airplane and you know by the way when as a when in a flying club all the members share the cost evenly so you know if you if you do a lot of flight training there's more wear and tear that all the members have to have to pay for so it's it has to be what makes sense for you and the club and also what makes sense for the airport so yeah and there are i think i did see a, a question or a comment on there like there are there are um for-profit commercial operators that call themselves flying clubs they make you pay it they make you pay a joining fee they make you pay dues and then you know that's I, I mean, that's still a flight school and that's just a, a you know a clever way to to kind of get some more some more commitment and, and you know money out of you. So have a staff, have people on salary like they're paying people. It's um, yeah, I, I, you know, I I looked I kicked around to trying to figure out a way to make that work, that model work when I started this one. And it just doesn't mm -hmm. work if you're playing by the if you're if you're operating by the rules and the spirit of the rule, there's no way to do this. There's no way to do that legally um right under the, and and still have all and still share all of the benefits that are designated for flying clubs it just yeah. doesn't work yeah and i mean and also i should point out too like i'm not i'm not the flying club police you know i see this stuff go on you know and and again if, if you can if, you, if it works for you and your airport and and you can do it i mean all the stuff i'm saying i'm telling you not to do there are clubs out there that are doing that exact thing and they're and they're completely fine right so mm -hmm. it, it has to you have to have to do what makes sense and also you have to think about you know if, if you're thinking about starting a flying club you know again think about what that mean what that's going to be like for your members right um chris we, we're talking about as your club grows you know how do you keep people involved how do you keep people you know active in the club and and there there definitely is a, a tipping point where a, a, a club gets so big that the members start feeling like members and more like customers where they're not they, it's just transactional like mm -hmm. i pay the money to, to to fly these airplanes and i leave right when when really clubs should be it's all about sharing it it's about you know learning about how to maintain an airplane about you know getting to know your members and and you know working together to share aviation and that's 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 what a club should be in its essence and when when you grow to you know five six ten airplanes and you know hundreds of members like that's very difficult to 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 kind of get to to get that same feel and it's very hard to get back once you've lost it. <laughs> so well, before we kind of rapid fire, maybe throw a lot of these questions because I don't want to leave people hanging. Um, but I wanted to say so a lot of this conversation has been in around sort of defining what flight clubs are, how they mm -hmm. vary, and you know what it, what constitutes one and how to maybe do it on some level. Um, one question I wanted to kind of put out there 
Um, cause you know, we've got some student pilots in the, in the chat here and we've got people that are, um, you know, in the middle of getting their license when you're, you know, on the brink of getting your, your certificate and you're ready to kind of do the next thing. Um, what would be some of the most basic uh, advice, uh, you would give to somebody to kind of just, you know, how do I evaluate? I barely understand this arrangement and, you know, okay, 501 C three and for profit. And mm -hmm. I don't know, man, I just, I just got my license and I want to fly and I don't want to fly my training airplanes anymore. And I'm really looking for a club. Um, what are the things I should look for or, uh, you know, look out for what, what would be your advice to somebody who's looking at a flying club? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we actually have a bunch of resources on our website about how to evaluate, <laughs> yeah. how to kind of tire right. pick and shop for a, <laughs> for a flying club. Um, but yeah, so I, I would just encourage you to go to, go to meetings, um, hang out with the members. Are they, are they welcoming? Will they let you see the club bylaws? Um, does the airplane fly a lot as an active club? Um, mm -hmm. you know, some, some red flags for clubs is if they never have meetings and you know, they're, the members don't really, you know, connect and engage. That's, that's probably not something you want to try and join most likely. Um, so yeah, just, just go to the meetings, get a feel for the club. Um, I was, I was very lucky. I mentioned that I have a, a bunch of my friends or members of, of my flying club. So I, I got to spend some time in the airplane, go flying in it and stuff. And, and, you know, I, I went to a few meetings. So, so that was all really good. And they, and it, I just, it was like a fit for, like I said, the type of flying I want to do. I like to go places with an airplane. So I, I, this club, my club is very, um, our rules are very favorable to longer, longer rental or not rentals. I, I shouldn't say that longer um, <laughs> reservations, <Sorry. laughs> yeah. um, longer reservations, longer, transactions. And stuff, so. longer pr profitable transactions. I mean, <laughs> I mean reservations. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so you, uh, yeah, just go, go into meetings and, and talking to the members is going to yeah. be your best bet for, for finding it for, you know, trying out a new club. Hey, before we jumped into these questions, Brian, I do want to give Drew a chance to talk about the educate the the instruction piece is important. It's an important distinguishment. We kind of touched on, maybe we did touch on all we wanted to say, right? It's just basically that the flying club can't be a school. It can't advertise yeah. instruction, but it is allowed to allow students to train in their airplanes with club approved instructors. Yes, exactly. So a, a club can never provide a flight instructor. So as a member of the club, you are using the airplane that you have access to, right? And then separately, you hire an instructor and compensate them on whatever terms you agree with. So you should never be in a position where you have to pay the club, which the, the and then the club pays the instructor. That's that's right. crossing the line to being a flight training provider. Um, and another point to make is if you're thinking about forming a flying club, you know, really, really kind of look at what you're trying to get out of it there too, right? So if you're if you're forming a club for the purpose of teaching people how to fly. That's probably not the the right the right uh, uh, way to go about it. You you want right. to form a flight school, and and by the way, insurance companies are going to see right through that. If you have a high 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 member turnover, a lot of student pilots, um, you know, if people jo join the club, get their license, and leave right away, that's that's going right. to not you're going to see some pretty nasty insurance premiums. We we actually had a couple of meetings where we defined it's not in our bylaws but we defined kind of the spirit to be like we think that we view flight training in our club allowing flight training in our club is a, is just a natural byproduct of the club environment that we've created. So like Yeah. It's not a it's not a mission. And in fact, it's went as far to say like if it becomes an interference with the core, you know, mission of ava highly available um well-maintained aircraft available to our pilot members, then we'll just reevaluate training as a whole. But it's, it's very keyly distinguished. I mean, we love our student members. Like yeah, they bring so much to the atmosphere and just there's, it's such so fun to see people solo for their first time or go take their check rides or whatever. Oh, like yeah. As a culture, we love it, but it is absolutely, yeah. like you say, there's, there are other components of it. schedule. It's a schedule hog. It's, I mean, there's some other components that kind of make it challenging. So it's, it's carefully balanced and it's working currently in our arrangement, but it's always open for evaluation. But that, that is a key distinction that you try to make real careful. Like the club yeah. can't offer, like you can't be the broker of instruction. Like it's correct. Not yes. That way. Yep. Yeah. No, again, no services to the public. That's, that's very important. And I, and I will say though, as a, you know, in flight training, maybe, but especially once you get your license, the, the quality of instruction you get in a club is going to be awesome. Cause typically the, the instructors, our club, our club has a few instructor members, but um, you know, a lot of clubs have, you know, instru instructor members that they, they have another job and they just instruct for fun on the side. So you're, you're, 
you're not getting the same you're, you're you know you know the person and you know how they they teach and you know it's a really good way to kind of expand your your proficiency and horizon so you know we the, i really i really market flying clubs as a landing ground for someone that just got their license and, and wants to to explore and 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 you know get out there so that's that's the, that's the sweet spot for a flying club is private pilot license and beyond is, is kind of how i see it that's awesome um i'm gonna throw some questions at you now are you ready for these I'm ready. All right. Elliot asks, I know that profit is a bad word, but is a club a way to offset the costs of ownership? And I'm going to let you answer. And then I'm going to ask a follow-up question. Okay, great. So um, if you own the airplane and you lease it to a club, right? Um, it It's not going to be, you're, you're not going to get rich. No one's getting rich off of flying clubs. It's just not, not how it works. Right. So, you know, if you, you when you lease an airplane to a club, there's a, a typically a monthly lease fee that the club pays the owner of the airplane, and there's also an hourly flying rate for the, for the consumables, right? The the engine, the you know the prop, all the overhaul stuff, um, all the time based stuff, and then and then you the club and the owner agree on who's going to fix what and who's responsible for what. So that's that's how that works. And again, that that arrangement it should never be. You know, the the club is not going to be paying you you know thousands of bucks a month. It's not going to. So if right. you have a note on the airplane, it's it's probably you know you, you might break even, you might not, right? So it, again, the the benefit you get as an owner is your plane's getting flown more, and it's getting flown by people that you know, and it's not getting beat up like it would be in, in a flight school or a you know a commercial operation. So um, yes, it will it will slightly offset the cost. Um, and and I will say that. Um, well, someone, someone put it really well. They said a, a flying club is like 90% of all the magic of owning an airplane. Um, you know, it's, it's all the, the access is better. Um, the, you know, the, the, uh, the equipment is typically better, um, uh, all that good stuff. And it's just, you know, you, the, the catch is you have to share the airplane with other people. Does that make, does that make sense? That's that. And so my follow-up question was going to also be, um, you know, we, we did a lot of maneuvering early on when we were adding planes. So we had, we had a lot of without going too deep in the weeds, um, the, the original, the starting up of the club, one of the board members of the club was also the owner of the airplane that he was leasing the club. So we had some, we had to recuse him from any of those negotiations. It was a very, there was a lot of legal kind of stuff to jump sure, on. And in sure. fact, we ultimately made some other changes, but like, um, just to kind of alleviate any appearance of that kind of conflict of interest. But, um, I was going to comment, you, you hit the nail on the head, like the, I lease a plane uh, to the club that I run. And so I also had to be like, y'all are going to have to decide if this is the plane that you want. And it, you know, it worked out that it was, but we do have a loan on the airplane. Um, mm -hmm. And so we are not getting rich, but I think in this economy, it was the right place at the right time as well, though, because of the appreciation of aircraft uh, aircraft over the last three years, like what yeah. you're effectively doing is having another organization that is paying the cost to own it and to operate it and to maintain it while wow, it appreciates in value. So like at the end of the lease term, I may come out ahead because I haven't paid anything on the note, but it's paid for. Yeah. And now I have the assets, but it's not like a, it's not a cash flow. Like you say, nobody's making money. Nobody's making money in flying clubs. Like um, it's only the asset that's appreciating. Um, yeah. And so there's that. Yeah, the, this, the stuff that kind of makes my skin crawl. I mean, you know, you get people that you you talk to them like, yeah, I want to form a club. I own this airplane. I want to form a club around it. And you, it boils down to they want to get a flying club to pay for their new engine or pay for their new panel and then, and then you know, rip the airplane away. Like that's, you know, so people think they can do that. And it's just, no, it's, it's that's right. not how it works. Right. Um, Stephen Caldwell asks, I live in a small area and would love to start a club here. Is there a minimum number of people that would make starting a club not worth the hassle versus a small co-ownership situation? Yeah. Um, I think a happy number to start a club is, is five. You want to have at least five people to, to start. You, you, you know, the clubs can be smaller than that. I think we define a club, anything over three people is a, is a flying club. Um, if, if there's a market for it, right, there's interest then I think a club is a good way to go because with a, with a partnership, it's generally four to five people is, is the max you can see in a, in a, a co-ownership agreement. Um, and you know, insurance will, will kind of dictate that sometimes. Um, the nice thing about flying clubs is you can scale it, right? You can, you can expand from five people to 10 to 15. Um, 
and and generally 10 to 12 people is, is like the happy number for one airplane 10 people sh that, that many people sharing an airplane you know it, it, it keeps the availability up there but also you get a ton of usage out of the airplane mm -hmm. so um yeah so if if you have at least five people interested and and like seriously committed i'd say go for it i would i would shoot for 10 because you know people are gonna kind of evaporate fall through the cracks a little bit um, but yeah, so in, in those small rural areas and, you know, Chris, you can attest to this. There's, there are, there's a, a market for, for clubs in more rural areas that you wouldn't expect. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. There's a demand for airplanes and they just don't exist. Um, they just don't exist, especially well-maintained ones that are available. Um, yeah. Fly sport wants to know how many roles in a small equity club, like with four to eight members. I think this was back when we were talking about, you know, um, like club roles, like, you know, yeah. you would have to have. Yeah, if you're if you're in a smaller club, you're definitely wearing multiple hats for sure. Um, it, that's just the reality of it. So if someone's going to be the president, president. Uh, someone's going to be the secretary, treasurer. You know, some things like that. So um, I would encourage you to, if you're if you're thinking about forming a flying club, don't have this "I'm going to do it myself" mentality. Definitely find people that are going to be committed and invested, and um, and are going to help you out. And the same thing with the services that we provide at AOPA. Like I'm not going to form the club for you. I'm going to you know coach and counsel and provide, you know, advice and, and connect you with people who, you know, can help you with the, your problems. Um, but, you know, you want people to have ownership and skin in the game and, you know, make it theirs basically. That's awesome. Um, Adam would like to know, doesn't a club get cheaper insurance if every member is a licensed pilot? So if you're not, if you're not offering training. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So, um, insurance especially you know that, that we could do a whole podcast on aviation insurance oh it's, renewal time, it's renewal time for us right now so oh I'm yeah already, we just did that I'm in our club middle, oh my gosh yeah so but generally speaking yeah the, the uh, a club has to provide a roster to the insurance company um and then and they they list the hours have you had any um fire violations have you had any accidents you know all the standard stuff um and then and then, yeah, they, they kind of look at the least qualified person. Um, for most most clubs that are operating, you know, fixed gear, single engine airplanes, which that's the majority of the clubs in this country are, are flying fixed gear, single engine. You know, the, the, having a load time pilot's not going to kill you. Um, but yes, having having student pilots will will raise the rates. And I would encourage you if you're forming a club and you're going to allow student pilots, keep the ratio pretty low. Um, you're Chris, you have a really good ratio in your club. For like a 10 person club maybe two members can be student pilots at, at a given time right i think that's that's a happy number you don't you definitely don't want you know it, it'd be a lot more expensive to insure a 10 student club exactly um this is a good one i forgot one of our patrons knew you were coming on tonight and had a question he can't be here tonight but one dull geek who is a is a regular uh with us here on the on the podcast if one were to start a flying club how do you convince yourself that the other people you're inviting to co-own? So these are two questions, and you know, yeah, I think mm -hmm. you, where you co-own your airplane are trustworthy enough to be part. Yeah, so um, that's that's a great question, and you know, it's it's something that you know, Chris. I'm sure you go through this when you're you know interviewing and screening prospective members in your club, right? So having a having a solid um, screening process is a good idea. I've heard of some clubs were actually running like credit checks and background checks. I think that's a little, little extreme, but I mean, Hey, you know, if you, if you want to pay for that, um, we, in our club, we have, we get three volunteers to do a, a, a at least an hour long interview with any prospective member. And you're looking for people who want to join your club first and then also want to fly the airplane, right? You want members that are not just there to use the airplane. Um, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit it, but in the four plus years I've been in my flying club, there are members I've never met because <laughs> they never come to any, never come to any meetings. You know, I, I've never met them in person. I've maybe talked to them on the phone once. Um, so yeah, you want people that, that want to be, that want to contribute to the club. They, they want, they have, they have things to offer. They, they, they like what your club does and like, here's how I can fit in, right? You want someone that's going to kind of fit into your organization and also to the, 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 the quality of the flying. I mean, you know, people make mistakes, accidents happen. Um, but you know, if, if someone has a good safety attitude there, they, um, they take criticism. Well, they, they, they have, a, they're, they're kind of humble about their flying. I think that's a, a good sign that that's someone that you can be a, be in a club with. Um, and then also on the other side of that, if someone turns out to be a kind of a bad apple, having strong bylaws and, and ways that you onboard and off and outboard people um, from your club 
you know, if if someone does something really dumb and it's clear they're not going to be a, a good member, having a way to, to effectively bounce them out of the club that you know won't get you won't get you in trouble and is fair and and you know agreed upon by everyone is, is very important because yeah things get contentious. You know, uh, flying clubs have been sued in the past, right? It does happen. So having having good bylaws is is very important. And again, that's that's one of the services that we provide. I am not a lawyer, but I've read. Uh, hundreds of club bylaws i know i know what works and what doesn't um and then also too i I, at the end of the day i'll probably recommend that you run it by an attorney in your state just to make sure excellent so everybody can get sued doesn't matter where you are doesn't matter no no yeah and you know and and (laughs) that's the nice thing is you know club is a nonprofit corporation so that does provide some protection and um directors and officers insurance is a is a thing in clubs too so that's that's another option so real quick, how, how do you not be a bad apple? What are some bad apple examples? Like what are some things that people have done that are, you know, have made them not be in your club or some other club? Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> pe- people that it's, it's very clear and you know, that's why we do this interview, right? We don't just take anyone off the street that want that can, can pay our buy-in and join our club. Um, it's, if it's someone that's, it's very clear that they're just there to build time to get to the airlines or to get, to get to somewhere. Right. Or, it's very clear that they, they want to use the airplane um, a lot for, for like business travel or something like that. And, and by the way, you can certainly use a club airplane for, for business travel. Mm. You cannot use a club airplane to make money. So you can't, mm. you know, fly pipeline patrol or, you know, uh, fly cargo or passengers for hire in a, in a club airplane. Um, so, yeah. So if it's, if it's very clear that they're just there to use the airplane, that's, that's the big red flag and very quickly makes itself obvious in an, in an interview, I think. Um, and then also just, you know, we talked about, we talk about people's flying. I mean, we, we had a, a gentleman try to join our club who had, had previously balled up a, a rental airplane at another airport and just talking, talking to him about the incident and what he took away from it. It was, it was clear that he didn't learn his lesson. Right. Mm. So, yeah. So that, that's part of it. And you, you check people's logbooks to make sure they're legit. Yeah, that's that's another good thing to do. So you're, you're like, dude, I, I've got Catherine's report right here. I, I re- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was it was at the shortest runway. It's called I, I won't get too specific. But it was a very short runway. Okay. And uh, yeah, it, 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 that has claimed a lot of propellers, a lot of nose gear <laughs> from people, people purposing and whatnot. Mm. Yeah. All right, man. Uh, so one other question I have is, you know, for instance, I, I mentioned I'm on the waiting list for a club that's actually a quite a storage club here in Tennessee. It's the the Lebanon Flying Club. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it's it's a strange thing because you're like, OK, yes, I want to be on the waiting list. But you also I've got to start going to their meetings or kind of getting to know them. But it's also it's two years out. I, yeah. I don't even know what I'm doing a month from now. You know what I mean? So it's a strange thing to sort of know when or how to approach. I want to keep my spot and they're not going to take it from me. I mean, I've officially, you know, put myself in line, but my number will come up, but uh, you know, what's the, like just from a sort of, um, I don't know, almost like a social way. Like what is the norm or, you know, what, what, like, should I just start hanging out with them? Like, man, I can't wait to be, Oh yeah, we're totally going to fly in two years, guys. (laughs) <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, it's tough. And from, from my, from my side, right. I'm in a flying club that has a wait list. Right. So how do I keep, how do I keep you? I, I, you're a cool guy. I want you to be in, be in the club, but you know, we, we have a wait list. Right. Um, so I, I we, we recommend that you kind of have like a, an a, again, that active social culture comes into play. So you know, see if you, you can join as a social member. You're you're involved in the club, but you don't have access to the airplanes yet. That's that's a really good way to to, to stay involved. And you know, go to plane washes and hang out with the pilots. And you're, you'll get rides. You'll get you know, you you can't log time as pilot command in the airplane, but you can safety pilot right. So you can get to know the airplane and get to know the members ahead of time. Um, and yeah, so like what I did, I you know, I rented all the way up until I joined the club um, from a from a local flight school, and I you know, but I. I, I did safety pilot for my friends that were in the club and I, I spent a lot of time in the airplane and got to know the members and, um, and all that good stuff. So yeah, just, just try to try to be active. Yeah. Be a fly on the wall in meetings and stuff. I think that's a good idea. Eventually I'll be lurking enough. They're like, just, just give the guy a spot. Like, I don't yeah, yeah. Annoy them until they admit you. Perfect. <laughs> uh, 
Drew Myers from AOPA is our guest tonight talking about flying clubs. Uh, before we, there are a couple more questions I want to get to Miguel, but before we do, I want to give you a chance. AOPA has for years been a, an advocate, a strong advocate for flying clubs. I want to give you a minute. Just you're there to provide resources for people who want to start them, who people want to join them for existing clubs who have questions. Do you want to take just a minute, talk about what you do at AOPA, what's available to people and how they can find you to take advantage of these services, which we did for our club. And I can tell you it, it's, that's how we got off the ground. I mean, that's how we got the thing launched was it would not have been possible without the support we had from AOPA. No question. Awesome. Yeah. That's, that's great to hear. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. Um, so I work, I work for an initiative called You Can Fly. And um, our entire mission, our, our purpose is more people flying more. Um, so we have a, our high school initiative. We have a, a STEM curriculum that's in over 400 high schools. Um, that's It's not just making pilots, it's making people who are familiar with the, with the aerospace industry and the career opportunities there. Um, we also have our flight school initiative, which is the, our, their purpose is to improve the the student pilot experience to get more students more student pilots through the program and uh, to their pilot's license because the the attrition rate for student pilots is kind of ridiculous it's uh, i think it was like 75 percent of people who start don't finish their license so we're, we're working on ways to improve that and one of the ways we we've done that is with a, a adaptive training software and an app that we um that we're testing now and it's it's in 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 student pilots hands now so it's called AFTA. Check it out on our website. It's a, it's a really good program. Um, then I come in. So, you know, again, a, a landing ground for, for pilots who just got their license. So with, with the Flying Clubs Initiative. And we we support and help form flying clubs all over the country. I, I mentioned earlier, we've, we've formed, uh, I think we're up to 213 flying clubs. Um, and, and what I do, we're, we're kind of just like subject matter experts, right? Um, I, I talk to flying clubs all over the country. I, you know, I, I um, help form flying clubs all over the country. So I've, I've seen, I've seen a thing or two. I know what the challenges are and what, you know, what the typical pitfalls are for, a, for someone that's starting to form a flying club. And also too, we, we get cl uh, club calls where the club is struggling and what can we do? How do we, how do we kind of revitalize our flying club? Um, Cause you know, like, like any organization clubs have life cycles and my club has been around since 1969. And, you know, if you don't adapt and, and, you know, refresh and revive, you know, revitalize your club, it's, it's going to kind of, kind of die away. Right. So how, so I, I get that question a lot too, of like, well, how do I, how do I get younger members? There's a bunch of old guys in my club that, you know, they're, you know, they're uh, not flying it very much. So like, well, what do we do? So we, we help with that. Um, we help promote your flying club. I, I, we, um, We'll help you find members. We'll help. Uh, we we do like a hosted podcast or a uh, sorry a webinar where we'll promote your flying club and and, and explain the benefits of joining um, to to AOPA members in your area. So yeah, we're, we're, yeah, yeah. So and and also too, like I don't have all the answers, but I I talk to clubs all day. So you know, I was mm -hmm. I was. Uh, speaking with someone last week and they were thinking about uh, adding a diamond to their club. And I, I was like, all right, well, yeah, you know, this is how you add an airplane and here are the names of three flying clubs that operate diamonds and, and what that, what that looks like. So yeah, you know, the, the networking aspect of it is huge. Um, and you know, we have just like these, we have, you know, exemplar clubs um, like Chris, you mentioned, you're kind of thinking about doing a consultancy thing. So that, I think that's awesome. Um, and yeah, so just talking to other flying clubs who have been through it, I think is, is huge. Um, and then we also publish a uh, monthly newsletter called Club Connector, publishes the third Sunday of every month. Um, and we we feature we feature flying clubs all over the country. And then our the, the real bread and butter of it is our question of the month where we answer you know the burning questions about about, um, you know, that, that we get asked a lot this month for, you know, spoiler alert for, <laughs> for all the, for all the, the listeners on the podcast here, um, we're going to be talking about officer positions and how do you get people to, to volunteer for officer positions and how do you, awesome. how, you know, how do you keep that, keep that kind of keep it from a, a small group of people doing all the work. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, there, and we have a ton of resources on our website, just go to the, the AOPA.org, um, flying clubs. Um, and then, you know, you'll find out we have guides, we have sample documents, we have our flying club finder, like you mentioned, um, that's based on, you know, you can search for a club name, you can search for an airport and see what clubs are there. Um, and, and by the way, if you're forming a flying club, you can advertise it on that website as well as a club information. And, and we've, we've seen folks, um, get, get a lot of interest in their club just by advertising on our finder. So, and then lastly, I got to mention too, we have our rusty pilots program. 
under you can fly, which helps get people back in the air. It, it covers the ground portion of a flight review and it just kind of gets you back, back thinking about flying in the, in the modern world, especially if you've, I, you know, I, I can't imagine if you've, if you uh, stopped flying 15 years ago and you know, all the technology and change that's happened. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then finally we have our flight training scholarships as well. So we, we have, you know, from, from start to finish, we have, you know, we have resources that will help people fly more. That's, that's what we do. Um, and I should also plug that I'm not, I'm actually not funded by your AOPA membership dollars. Although we appreciate everyone being an AOPA member. Um, we are funded by the AOPA foundation. That's a 501c3 charity that, you know, funds programs like this. Um, so, and any, any contributions are always greatly appreciated. have to have to plug that. That's great. Love it. No, yeah. Yeah. It's been, I mean, I, I, I'm not kidding. I mean, the, the, the upfront work that really, to really understand, I, I came to you without a really good understanding of how a flying club is structured and what it really looks like. You know, I, I'd heard the term thrown around and knew of a couple that had some planes and some members, Yeah, um, but it was tremendously helpful. And, um, and I think that, uh, I think the work that's going into helping expand them across the country is, is good and needed. And I do think, um, there's no better way to get connected and involved in aviation after your training than in a flying club. It's on all levels. I just think is the, um, is the way to do it. And on that note, we're going to answer, I got, I have to ask this question because it's sort of along the culture line of a club might be a Chris question, but how do you decide on a number cap for a non-equity club? And I, Drew, your 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 guesstimates on members per plane was spot on. We mm -hmm. added we added a second. Um, we had too many members when we added a second plane. I think we were up to uh, probably eighteen. Um, they weren't all actively flying though. That's kind of the trick. Like a lot of them don't fly much. So yeah. Uh, and then we added our third when we got to thirty. So that would be ten per plane and at 36 uh, our meeting today like i mentioned we're already talking about uh talking about number four and i don't know when we'll cap it i think like you said when this thing if it gets to the point where it starts to feel like um everybody has a member id number and i don't know who these people <laughs> are anymore um, yes, we've probably yeah. kind of outgrown the we've got to the we've got to that limit probably when we get there but at this point um we know everybody everybody knows yep. each other and we're enjoying multiple planes so our current model is to keep adding planes as we add members until we get to a place where it feels like it's got to a kind of a, you know, everybody's a number situation. Yeah. And, and one thing I'll add to that, if, if you're forming a club, right, everyone's going to be really excited that they're in the flying club and they're going to fly a whole bunch. Right. And as clubs age and, you know, members, you know, ebb and flow in their life, you know, life lifestyles, I guess. Um, you, you'll have you know less active members and more active members. So um, the other limiting factor is going to be insurance. Um, you'll find that the insurance rates you get per number of people, it, it, you know, it's generally around uh, 12 to 15 is kind of the max they like to see sharing one airplane. Um, you know, and I say generally, the, the insurance game is always changing. I think I have a, a grasp on it and then I'll talk to a club and they'll tell me something that I thought was impossible or something. So, so yeah, that's, that, that is going to be a major consideration. If, if you're thinking about forming a flying club is the insurance question. So that's, that's an early conversation you need to have is with a insurance broker. Very good. Yeah. Well, this has been excellent. This was, uh, this is super informative, uh, even for me, who's been doing this for a little while now. And um, I hope everybody enjoyed. Thanks again for uh, for jumping on at short notice. I'm very excited. Oh, sure, yeah. I hope the weather cooperates later this month. Drew is coming to our neck of the woods, knock on wood, uh, to actually do a presentation at our Flying Club's fall social event. Um, yeah, I can't wait. It's going to be a good time to see everybody and meet everybody and kind of see what we've going on in Fairmont. Um, Can I get on the waiting list for your club, Chris? Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, you could join right now. He'd be um, the perfect member because he couldn't. He's, you pay the dues <laughs> and never fly the airplane. <laughs> we're, we're, we're actively accepting those kind of members, Brian. Yeah, so remote members, <laughs> remote <I'll> members <laughs> welcome. Nice. I'll send you the application tonight, and you can uh, fill it out and get back. No, that's to awesome. It. So you're going to go to Fairmont. That's that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I've actually. It's funny. I actually, I was. I've been to Fairmont. I, I landed there to get gas once, and then then that, that was like right before you know a couple months before Chris called me. So I was like, oh yeah, I know Fairmont. You so <laughs> should get that on. A t-shirt, Chris. You should, you're Fairmont. That's right. Yeah. I landed there to get gas once. 
once and haven't, <laughs> haven't been back because there's not much else to see. Right. But, uh, now there's a flying club. So yeah, uh, yeah. a guy did come out and offer me a bottle of water, which I was very impressed with. I'm like, there wow, this is that Southern hospitality, right? Came, came out of the, came out of the shack and the uh, shack. Yeah. And yeah. A bottle of water. So, Drew, um, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Appreciate thanks for having me. Today. Yeah, it's been great stuff. I hope everybody found it helpful. Check out his stuff, uh, aopa.org slash flying clubs. Yeah. Um, um, and my, my email address is my first name, Drew, dot, my last name, Myers, M Y E R S, at aopa.org. So I'd love to hear from you. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. Brian, thank you for podcasting with me tonight. We'll do, it again. Thanks. we'll Thanks, Drew. do it again in two weeks. Thank you, Drew. Thanks, everybody, for the great questions in the chat tonight. And we'll see you in a couple.